All right, hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, welcome back to the Spoken Truth podcast slash vlog slash whatever else this is going to end up becoming. Today, I just wanted to talk about some really cool concepts that were, uh, I would say, reintroduced to me today. As part of my job, one, one of the functions of my job is that I teach English to some Zen Buddhist masters here in Taiwan. And uh, often this leads to some really, really, really cool conversations. Um, and today, I uh, ended up having some great conversations with one of the Buddhist masters that I teach. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there to teach class, I'm there to teach English, but I end up feeling like I'm the one who is uh, the student and I'm learning a lot. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about what I learned today. Um, and it's kind of a, a lot of material to pack into just a little bit of time. Um, so I'm just going to talk about it and keep talking about it. And um, it, hopefully it won't just ramble on too much. But as an incentive, uh, if you stick around for a little while, there will be a, a little bit of a Chinese lesson later as part of what I'm talking about here. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, relativity, um, divisions, time, space, the nature of the cross, um, all of these things that are, to me, really, really interesting. And uh, this whole conversation started uh, because I asked my uh, Buddhist uh, student, master, I'm not really sure. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I asked her, um, I said, I'm having trouble establishing a daily meditation habit. And what can I do to try to make that happen? And as part of her explanation, she talked about relaxing. Uh, she talked about relaxing the body, uh, which I thought was really interesting because she said that when you relax the body, you relax the mind. And only when your body and mind get into a real relaxed state are you able to kind of um, get into that sweet spot that we all kind of strive for in meditation. Um, you know, we tend to carry around a lot of anxiety. We don't really realize it most of the time. We're not conscious of this. Um, I think I remember Alan Watts calling it, um, I think he defined the ego as a low-grade tension that we constantly have, a, lo a constant low-grade muscular tension. And so we have this, uh, this tension in our bodies, and it's always there. And we have this tension in our minds because we're always just thinking with this chatterbox monkey mind. And one of the great things about meditation is that it helps us to relax all of that. And it helps us to come to a place of peacefulness and quiet within ourselves, which obviously has many benefits, not only for our psychological state, but also for our physical state. When we're in a constant state of low-grade uh, muscular tension, it causes all kinds of physical problems with us as well. Um, so for me, I, uh, I really want to get into a meditation habit where I'm practicing daily. Uh, and I really believe this could be a life changing thing for all of us. Um, and so she said, the first step is you have to relax. Um, you sit down, you get yourself into a seated position and you just relax everything from this discussion about relaxation. We moved into a discussion about emptiness and she said, she mentioned that the sky is empty actually. And I thought this was very poetic. You know, the sky is so spacious that it can accommodate anything. The sky is by nature empty. And because of this emptiness of the sky, anything can exist within that sky. And you could even think of this as space. All of the planets, all of the stars are able to exist and have this, this physical existence because of all this empty space that we're existing in. Um, and I guess the analogy here is to get our minds uh, to, to sort of represent that space, that emptiness that all things can exist within. So the first concept here is relaxation, which leads to a state of space, emptiness. Um, and then from talking about space, you kind of almost can't talk about space without talking about time. Uh, because there's this whole time-space continuum. Time and space are very related. And she really went into a lot of depth about explaining how this works. And I thought that was really great. So talking about relaxation leads to talking about space, emptiness. Talking about space leads to talking about time. And time is simply the motion of the mind. 
So because the, the mind is in motion, we have the appearance of time. We have, well, I wouldn't say the appearance of time. We have appearance and disappearance of things, of thoughts, of objects, of anything. Um, because time is the result of the mind making distinctions. Um, I heard a quote recently. Um, I'm probably just going to get it wrong, so I'll just paraphrase it. But George Carlin said something like, the reason we have time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. Uh, and uh, from a quantum physics point of view, that probably isn't funny because that's, you know, that's what they say, actually. Everything is happening at once. Every, everything that exists, exists simultaneously, past, present, and future. Uh, that's really, really difficult for me to wrap my mind around. But this idea that time, we experience time so that we don't experience everything at once. Um, and be because of that, we could say that uh, boundaries cause existence. Uh, distinction, so let's say there's this vast emptiness, this nothingness, right? Um, I wouldn't even say nothingness, I would say emptiness, empty space. And we begin to make distinctions and we get this duality. We get this, um, this, this, this binary conception of things. Um, and this is where the meaning of the cross comes into play. And when I say the significance of the cross or the meaning of the cross, uh, for the purpose of this conversation, I'm not talking about uh, Christ um, in terms of redemption. I'm talking about the symbol of the cross, which I'm sure there's reason behind why the cross became the symbol for not only Christianity, but for many religious faiths. But it goes like this. Picture, picture that you have an empty sheet of paper, and this is emptiness. Then you draw a vertical line. That's the first arm of the cross. Now you've drawn one line. That's an action. That's a motion. Your mind does that. And by, by that action, by that motion, you have divided space into two, quad, or two parts. You draw another line. You draw the horizontal line. Now you've divided the first line into two, and you've divided space into four quadrants. This is pretty important because uh, a few reasons here. So with space, you, you, you take the cross, you, vertical, horizontal, you've divided space into four sections, four quadrants. This represents north, east, south, west, which is kind of arbitrary. They could really represent forward, backward, up, down, whatever, however you want to conceive of it. But for the purposes of keeping things... Uh, you know, talk about a bull and <laughs> keep it so where we can keep even keep talking about this. I'm going to use north, south, east, and west, right? So the first thing I want to talk about here is when you divide something like that, when you, when you cross section something, uh, first of all, are you dividing it or are you multiplying it? Uh, and that's not a conversation I want to get into right at the moment, but uh, in a sense, division is multiplication because you have one thing, you divide it into two, uh, yes, you've divided it in terms of quantity, but in terms of how many of something you have, now you have two of something, whereas before you only had one of something. So this relationship between multiplication and division, uh, this is really kind of a dance the way I see it. Um, so you have the cross, the crossing of two lines. The one line is divided into two by the cross line, and this division, one becomes two, two becomes four. Um, the two lines of the cross make these four quadrants, the four realms, the four directions. And this uh, is the world. This is part of the world. You keep dividing, you get more and more worlds. You keep dividing those four, you get more and more dimensions. Uh, you've got four quadrants, four directions. Um, this is where the Chinese lesson comes into play. The Chinese word for world is shi jie. As you look at the word shi jie, uh, I'll try to describe it for you. Um, the character shi. Um, it's composed of three horizontal lines and three vertical lines. They're not perfectly one, two, three, one, two, three, but basically what you have is three vertical and three horizontal lines. Um, and this shi is the passing or the flowing of the three periods of time representing past, present, and future. Uh, this is movement, this is change, um, and actually past, present, and future exist because of motion. So this motion then is represented by the three vertical lines and the three horizontal lines of the word shi. Now jie, the second word in shi jie, which means world in Chinese. The second word uh, jie, this word means a boundary. Literally, this means a boundary. Um, by extension, we can say that this, this boundary 
Well, this boundary is the reason we can have the quadrants. Each line is, you can consider that line a boundary. Um, you know, you put one line, you've divided it into two spaces. You put another line, you divide it into four spaces. This is the boundary um, without which you can't even have those four quadrants or those four directions, right? Um, so by extension, this boundary can also mean division or factor or cause. So basically, in this sense, boundaries create things. Uh, because boundaries create space and within space we have the possibility for things to arise um, more boundaries means more things more distinct things more objects right um, all objects exist because of boundaries and if there were no distinctions there would be no things um, so this is what you have the, the Buddhists talk about it as um, an interweaving of time and space that goes three four four three uh, so 12 and 7 here, again, are very important, just like in the biblical numerology. Um, you know, 7 is the holy number. It, it, it expresses God's holiness. And 12 is the number of completion. Uh, if you look at the numerology of the Bible, particularly of the Old Testament, <clears throat> the number 3 represents God. You have the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You have the fact that uh, this 3 sort of represents a completeness or a perfection. And then... Um, Four, again, represents things, represents creation, the four corners of the earth, the north, south, east, west. Um, in the book of Revelation, you have the, the, the four beasts, right, uh, on the face of this, like, angel or whatever. So this, this sort of symbology is, is abundant in the Bible. It's all over the place. And I think it's cool that this is also in Buddhism. And it's in Buddhism in this sort of, like, uh, this way of explaining where everything comes from, this way of explaining creation and how things come into existence. So we've got three, four, four, three. The three represents the periods of time, past, present, and future, as we've said. And the four the, represents the four quadrants of space around the cross. So north, south, east, west. Let's just call it that. I'll use the same kind of example that, um, that my student slash teacher used for me. If I take my hand and I, I make it into a fist, I put it in front of the camera here. Um, this is happening in the present moment, and I have the four directions around my hand, north, south, east, west. Again, this is arbitrary. I know there are infinite directions around my hand, but for the purposes of explanation, I've got my fists, I've got the four directions around my fists. Now, my fist was just there, so my fist also sort of exists in the past. If you remember my fist, you've recalled it, that fist, that fist is in the past, and each of those four directions are also in the past, around my fist um, and I'm going to do it again so now my fist is also in the future with the north south east and west the four directions all around my fist existing in the future and here it is right so we've got past present future uh, you've got the past present and future fist right and then for each of those layers of time or those um, those manifestations of time each of those three have four directions Another way of looking at it is that each of the four directions has its own past, present, and future. There's the east that exists now, the east that existed in the past, and the east that will exist in the future. There's the west that exists now, past, future, etc., with north and south. Um, so you've got this, um, you've got all four directions around each manifestation of time, and then you've got each manifestation of time around each of the four directions. Um, and so respectively, you've got 12 zones, 12 realms, 12 existences, 12 states of being. Um, these all kind of like weave together. And this is what makes up our world, uh, according to the Buddhist concept, which I think is really, really cool. I think it's super interesting um, that we have this. Um, we went ahead and, and kept talking about it and took this conversation a little bit further. I'm just checking my notes here. Um, this interweaving between threes and fours that makes up the world is actually a kind of play. Everything we're doing is, is a kind of play. We're playing. It's a game. Um, if you walk, each step has its own four directions, right? So I take one step. There's a north, east, south, and west. And it has each of those has its own past present and future right i take another step now i've got a new place to to start from looking at my north south east and west past present and future um each word that we say has its own 
past, present, and future, right? And you could go on with with any any of any any action. Sorry, I keep hitting the mic. Any action that you want to take, you have all of these possibilities. Um, and this all depends on motion, and this itself is relativity. This is the interplay of time and space, um, because my perception of direction is necessarily going to be different than yours and my perception of past present and future is necessarily going to be different than yours and how each of us perceives each of those concepts at any given moment is going to be different uh, because we're always in a constant state of flux a constant state of flow and everything is changing all the time uh, and so our perception is included in that uh, change and so we we always um at every moment, we're perceiving things a little bit differently, and this is a part of relativity. Kind of neat to play with the words here a little bit too, right? Because uh, each of us has our own definition of time and space, and we each of us has our own vision, and this vision depends on division. So the vision depends on division. Without division, there would be nothing to see, and we couldn't see anything. You have to have the division of light and dark to even be able to see anything, right? Um, you have to have the division of of one thing versus another thing in order to be able to call anything anything or to perceive anything as anything. Uh, the distinction between you and me. You even have to have this distinction of is versus is not. This in Chinese, in, in Lao Tzu, he always talks about wu and yo, right? Isn't and is. Without isn't, is isn't. Like <laughs> without empty space, without this concept of emptiness or nothingness, the concept of isness or or being really doesn't mean anything. Because just as the darkness delineates the borders of the light, um, it's like uh, chapter two of the Tao, right? All can see beauty and all call it so. From this their naming ugliness flows. All can see goodness and call it the same. This same recognition gives badness its name. Having and lacking produce one another, easy and hard completing each other. Um, I, I can't remember the rest. Upwardness, downwardness, tallness, shortness, all of these concepts, these opposites, they complete, perfect, and define each other. Um, so I'm sorry. So then you have the, the, the vision, which is division. Uh, and actually, all of this is illusion. According to Buddhists, all of this is illusion and all of this is delusion. So you've got vision, illusion, division, delusion. There's a lot of cool wordplay. And if any of you rappers out there want to uh, play with that, take it, do it, roll with it. Um, so we talk about a game. Uh, we talk about a game being something that you play. And if everything is, is, if everything is an illusion or everything is a delusion, then actually everything is a game. Uh, one interesting thing about game is that it can be a noun or a verb. Well, I guess it's a noun either way, right? You play a game. It's uh, it's a, it's something that you play, something that you do, right? Um, but game also means something that you hunt, an animal that you hunt for food, for sport, whatever. Um, and so it's it's very interesting that you have this idea of desire, of wanting something, of having a specific target um, in a game. Um, we're all playing the game. We're all trying to get something. And anything that you want to be engaged in has to be real, even though it's only a game. In a game, you still have winning and losing, right? There, it has to be real in order for it to mean anything, in order for it to even be interesting at all. If there's no stakes, the game doesn't matter, right? So this is why it's always funny when people say, oh, don't worry, it's only a game. If it's only a game, then what's the point in playing, right? Um, there was a story uh, that she told me today about um, a kid and his grandfather who went to a basketball game together. And the kid was really into the game. He's watching. He's like, yeah, get it. Go, go, go. Right. And the grandfather was kind of like, this is stupid, man. You know how cheap a basketball is? I can buy every one of you and your friends and all the kids in that team a basketball. And then you all have your own ball. You don't have to sit there worrying about trying to steal it from each other and run it across a court and put it in some stupid basket. Let me just buy everybody a ball, right? <laughs> and uh, obviously, I don't think I have to explain that joke. Uh, there, that, that's not the point, right? That's not the point of the game. The point of the game isn't just to get the ball, to have it. The point of the game is getting the ball within the rules of the game. And we are all playing a game. And what we need to understand is that the game is an illusion. Everything is an illusion. Everything is delusion. But if the illusion weren't real, then it wouldn't matter at all. So it's 
it's illusion, but the illusion is real. Um, otherwise, there's no point to playing. Um, and I, I do think this is true. I think this is truth. Um, I think we don't see this quite often because we've been uh, bound back to boundaries again, right? We've been bound by our own desires. Um, you know, we, we, we want certain things. We want them so badly. Um, we get so attached to the game uh, that we forget that it's just a game sometimes. I got to get all this money. I got to get all this success and I got to do all these things. I got to prove myself to my dad and my mom, whatever. We got all this garbage that we chase after. And actually, there's nothing wrong with that because we need to be playing games in order to exist. But sometimes we get so attached to the game that we forget it's a game. We forget that it's an illusion. We forget that we're all here playing um, and we kind of lose sight of, uh, of a greater purpose. Um, if you think about desires, if you take desires to their logical um, ultimate conclusion, it always results in war because I want this and you also want this, but only one of these exists and now we have to kill each other to see who can get it. Um, this is the ultimate end of competition. Um, not to say that all competition is wrong, not to even really make any kind of moral statement here at all, um, but, you know, war is suffering. Um, competing, in, in, in a sense, is, is suffering, for the loser, at least. Um, and if we want to eradicate suffering, the way to do that is to eradicate our desires. And I mean that in a practical way. I don't mean that, that I think we can ever get to a state of complete desirelessness. But I do think that if we can recognize that our life is a game, it's all just an interweaving of time and space. It's all a relativity. Uh, it's, it's all just this, um, we're existing in one dimension out of a lot of dimensions that are possible. Um, and we get so attached to time and space, right? This is my house, uh, you know, whatever. And we, 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 we keep our mind focused in the past um, on things that we regret or things that we miss about the past. We, we're always worried about the future. We tend to neglect the present, although a uh, Buddhist would say that all three are part of the illusion. Um, my point here is that if we remember that it's a game, we don't take our lives too seriously. We try to uh, play the game with eyes open, be at peace. And this comes back to what we started the conversation with, which is meditate, relax. Relax your body, relax your mind. Let those cycles of the mind, that constant chatter sort of like calm down. And uh, I believe that one, once we do that, we will find a quiet and peaceful place inside ourselves where we can see things more clearly um, and we can make the decisions that we make in life from a, a higher place or a, a better place in some ways. I even hesitate to use the word better. Um, if, if, if the life you want to have is a life of suffering, then who can stop you? You know, go for it. If you want to spend your life suffering, that's your choice and that's the game you're playing. I know that I played it for a really long time, many years, um, and I don't want to anymore. I want to play a new game. I want to play a game of peace and uh, I want to play a game of clarity. I want to play a game of, of, of helping others and helping myself no longer being a martyr or a sacrifice, right? Um, yeah, anyway, we, uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not really getting off the point, even though it seems like I am. I'm just trying to, to sort of bring it all around to where we began and where we began and where we ended with this conversation is peacefulness, relaxation. So uh, I know that I introduced a lot of really difficult concepts here, talking about time, space, continuum, and uh, math. Actually, um, the, the key to all of this is relaxation. The reason that we, we don't grasp this on a real internal level is because we, we allow this chit-chat and this, this constant anxiety to keep our bodies in, a, in, a, in an almost constant state of muscular tension, which does not allow us to relax, does not allow us to come to a place of peacefulness and clarity. So my admonition for you today is take 10 minutes today and just sit. Just sit, maybe close your eyes, maybe just watch your breath, maybe just pay attention to how your body feels or some specific part of your body feels and see if you can let go of just a little bit of that tension. See if you can let go of some of just maybe just a little bit of that constant mental chatter and after you're done see how you feel see if you feel better see if uh if you can see life as 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 more of a game that's fun and enjoyable and worth playing 
Um, and on that note, I'm going to say goodbye for now. Peace and love, y'all.